Watching Game of Thrones might change your life. What millions of people find so compelling is not just the well-drawn characters, the exquisite production design, the epic moments, the teasers and cliffhangers. Although it invites us into the beauty and mystery of another world, Game of Thrones has resonated with so many people because it is, most of all, a story about us. Game of Thrones is urgently preoccupied with how we encounter the other, our interactions with those who are different from us. Writer George R. R. Martin has created a world full of clashing cultures. In the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, each of the noble houses has its own distinct customs and values. The difficult, often jarring experience of encountering someone with values different from our own is presented repeatedly. Whether it's Daenerys' rude awakening to the culture of the Dothraki or the slave cities, or the friction between the bull-headed Baratheons and the sophisticated Lannisters, the potential for conflict and rivalry between different people groups and value systems is the very core of what Game of Thrones is all about. Throughout the story, we return again and again to the Wall. It is a literal barrier, built to protect the people of Westeros from those who are different. The feral and lawless wildlings and the mysterious White Walkers. It's a great big on the nose metaphor for all the barriers that we create to separate us from those who are different. There are the physical barriers, peace walls, that divide conflicted communities around the world. Spikes and rails that line shop fronts and upmarket housing areas to protect shoppers and residents from having to encounter the reality of homelessness. There are economic barriers, pricing practices that ensure people with higher and lower incomes shop, eat and are entertained separately. There are natural barriers of language and geography. There are social barriers of class culture and the social media echo chamber. For that reason, we will soon begin the construction of a great, great wall along our southern border. These barriers, visible and hidden, act on all of us, making it less likely for us to come face to face with someone who has different values, perspectives and life experiences. The philosopher Slavoj Žižek sees this as a universal human experience. Our basic fear is fear of the neighbour and all racisms play upon this, this abyss of the other. Fear makes sense in the world of Westeros where the struggle for survival and supremacy leads to relationships characterised by aggression. Outsiders are assumed to be enemies. It makes sense to treat even your allies with suspicion. Though we may like to think of ourselves as more sophisticated than the feudal world of Westeros, our relationships with those who are different can be equally characterised by fear. And yet, embedded in our culture, is a challenge to that fear, the inheritance of the Judeo-Christian call to love your neighbour. This notion of love thy neighbour, it's something very radical. It means love thy neighbour, love this radical otherness, not just love somebody who is like me. Zizek hears this call to love the radically other neighbour in one of the most controversial teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. The strong language of this somewhat unpalatable message 
is not in fact a call to hate, but to love. In Westeros, common folk give their loyalty first to family, then to one of the noble houses, then to a liege lord, then to their kingdom, and ultimately to the realm. So Jesus' first audience had similar spheres of loyalty, first to their own family, then to parents and siblings, then to their extended family of cousins, aunts and uncles, then to their tribe, and ultimately to the nation. These spheres of loyalty denote who you can rely on, who you are responsible to, who belongs. And on the very outside of those circles of belonging is everyone else, on the other side of the wall. Everyone who is not like you, foreigners, outsiders, others. In attacking the innermost of these circles, Jesus calls his listeners to hate, not their loved ones, but all the dividing walls that would make anyone else an outsider. It is a challenge to work against whatever ideas or structures might lead us to treat others as anything less than ourselves. This kind of boundary crossing encounter with the other does not come without cost, as Jon Snow discovers when he crosses the wall. He is alarmed by the brutality of the wildlings and wary of their unfamiliar culture. Slavoj Žižek warns us off this fantasy that foreigners and outsiders are going to be good and innocent. An encounter with the other is nothing if not toxic. As we come face to face with customs we may find distasteful and values that may be in direct conflict with our own. And yet, we are forced to acknowledge a shared humanity. You are not my enemy, and I'm not yours. In experiencing life with the wildlings, Jon Snow is forced to reassess his prejudices about them. Far from being feral, the free folk have their own moral code with a strong sense of community and a high price for betrayal. They are their own civilization, in some ways preferable to the world John has known. In his own culture, John is rejected because of his supposed parentage. The wildlings have no such obsession. An encounter with the other calls into question the assumed superiority of our own moral codes. It reveals our inherent prejudices. It causes us to question deeply held beliefs. It shakes our foundations. An encounter with the other is always traumatic and it is always transformative. When John returns south of the wall, he has been changed forever by the experience. He has a wider, more inclusive vision. He understands himself and others better, but he has paid a price. He is no longer the man he was. Often, the greatest cost of encountering the other can actually come from our own tribe, our own people, where the questioning of group values and boundaries can be seen as betrayal. You bring wildlings here, through our gates. Men, women and children will die by their thousands if we do nothing. Let them die. We got our own to worry about. Less enemies for us. The result of this boundary crossing is the same for Jon Snow as it was for Jesus of Nazareth. Their actions and words and relationships are seen as such a threat to the social order, so undermining of group identity that their own people conspire to kill them. For the watch. For the watch. 
For the watch. For the watch. The threat of exclusion or worse sanctions from our own people can be one of the strongest walls of all. Policing our relationships, strengthening division and preventing us from engaging with those who are different. And yet, in both our stories, there is some power that vindicates those who cross the boundaries and pay the price. As a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War, George R. R. Martin is all too aware of our human tendency to create enemies, to build barriers between our humanity and the humanity of others. By encountering the other, John Snow's eyes are open to a wider vision. The real danger may not come from where we thought. The barriers we thought were there to protect us may serve instead to create enemies. The greatest threat to our well-being may not come from outsiders, but from our own tendency to hate, our willingness to be divided. Convincing the warring families to forget ancient rivalries is not going to be a simple task, but Jon Snow is convinced it is essential for their survival. In a world of constant conflict, it makes sense to build walls. But the building of a world where those walls are no longer needed begins when we cross the boundaries and encounter each other. <laughs> <laughs>